Okay, I think we can start. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to this online panel organized by Sunak Rights Library of Koch University. So since April 2022, Sunak Library has been organizing online panels and talks that focus on the issues of cultural heritage, preservation, restoration, and museums. We have, so far, we have invited distinguished scholars and experts who talked about the importance of cultural heritage and the ways of preserving the cultural heritage with sustainable practices. So in this final panel, we have decided to place more emphasis on the importance of archives and the archival materials in preserving this cultural heritage. Meanwhile, we were also aware that this week is being celebrated as the International Archives Week. So we thought that it would not be a terrible idea to bring our ongoing work together with the International Archives Week and celebrate the importance of archives during this week that is specifically designed for archives and the archivists. So uh, perhaps I should give you a brief, a very brief historical background as to why this week is internationally celebrated as the International Archives Week. So in 2007, the International Council on Archives decided to designate a special day to emphasize the importance of archives and archivists in preserving cultural heritage and memory. So for this reason, in 2007, June 9 was chosen as the International Archives Day to celebrate the creation of the International Council on Archives. And as of 2019, this International Day was extended to the entire week to raise public awareness about the value of records and archives. So today we have two distinguished speakers and we will start with Helen Lindsay. Let me briefly introduce her. Uh, so she's a collections care and a conservation consultant. She specializes in storage, collection assessment and archive packaging. And since 2005, she has worked as a freelance collection care specialist in various archives, museums and libraries that are not only located in the UK and continental Europe, but also in continental Europe. Some of her clients include the Churchill Archives, British Film Institute, and the Feminist Archive North. And in 2019, she assumed the role of uh, head of the preservation at the Imperial War Museum. So before we move into the session and start the talk, I would like to give you some details this panel will be recorded to be shared on our YouTube channel, and we would like to inform you about that. And then there will be, at the end of the presentation, there will be a Q&A session at the end of this panel, and our audience may ask their questions in a written form or uh, on Zoom chat. And during this panel, simultaneous translation will be provided from English to Turkish, for those who want to follow the event in Turkish. And at the bottom of Zoom's interface, you will see an interpretation button and participants, our Turkish speaking participants need to click on Turkish to follow the event with the translation. Thank you again for joining us in this panel. And without losing any more time, I would like to give the floor to Helen Lindsay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm pleased to be here today to um, talk to you remotely about sustainability and archives. So I will share my screen. Um, okay, thank you. Um, It's widely accepted that climate change is a result of human activity and that it will take a significant alteration in behavior to counteract the dramatic forces that now affect our planet. Ultimately, much of our response to this is about personal choice. Are you prepared to recycle equipment rather than dispose 
to landfill? Are we prepared to pay a little bit more for materials or spend extra staff time prioritizing and focusing? It takes longer to make work more efficient. It, it takes eff, extra effort to change direction towards the greener future, but not only is it better for our planet, it will also be better for our working environment and our organizations if work becomes more efficient and holistically responsible. I believe people do want to embrace these changes, but often it feels overwhelming and difficult to know what to do as an individual that will make a difference. As organizations, archives have always had sustainability at their core, even if it isn't always called that. We aim to keep and make accessible documents now and in the future. Our aims are long-term. We talk about permanent retention. We have one eye on current needs, while the other is firmly trained on the more distant future audiences, 50 years, 100 years longer into the future. This could mean that the steps towards sustainability are shorter and simpler than organizations or businesses operating with shorter term goals, but only if we move determinedly in the right direction, building on success with clear and practical plans. And as with any major change in direction, planning is of course vital and every organization should be developing a sustainable a sustainability action plan. So before talking about that and what we can do, I want to return to the definition that I guess many people will be familiar with, but no less important to remind ourselves of it. In 1987, the United Nations defined sustainability as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So that's the goal, the long-term goal. And sustainable development, which is often talked about, is are the processes and pathways to achieve this. As we've as I've already said, sustainability is a concept that sits comfortably with archives as we naturally look to the future as well as the present. But what is harder, much harder, is finding the ways to embed methods and move into a world of, of um, consistent sustainability. So, as I said, we need a plan. Um, you could call it a sustainable act sustainability action plan or something similar. And many of you may already have these. And as with this list of objectives, they frequently start with the big win. Um, but that which is also one of the largest challenges, decarbonisation of buildings. Uh, I won't be touching on that element, but rather I want to discuss some of the other points on this list, primarily the area of consumables, and impact of systems operating within your organization. I'm no expert on climate change, but I'm part of the museum's sustainability action group. And um, what I want to do with this talk is just pull together some of the strands that we've talked about and that affect the work of conservation in archives and to introduce them with the context the concept of working holistically. So my talk will range over four main topics, archive packaging, collections care indicators, conservation planning and online resources and tools. Um, but starting with some basics and uh, in my life, um, most things can be brought back to food. We all need good food to survive, we know that. It's the most local, the best quality food that keeps us healthy. My basic principle when cooking is that if you start off with good ingredients then pretty much anything you make will be delicious and healthy. I think the same can be said in 
many other areas of life and, and archive materials and conservation generally. If you start off with good ingredients and basic principles, simple local processing according to your need and your budget, then half the job of sustainability is done. Archive materials are commonly made with a few identifiable ingredients. As we see here, familiar archive folders and boxes are generally made from pure cotton or wood pulp. They're available from internationally, uh, international companies, but if similar items can be sourced locally, that has to be a better solution. And when you look at the specifications and standards of rather than commercial product lines, that is, can be more possible. In this context, it's all about knowing what the specifications are and when they're needed, so as to be able to prioritize high quality materials for the right collections and the right media types. I always recommend that organizations use their best archival materials next to your object, next to your archive, your document, photo, book, it's the material that's in contact with your archive item that will have the most, in contact, the most impact on it. So if you have limited resources, and let's face it, we all have to manage budgets, look to the folders and sleeves in contact with your documents and make sure they are the ones that are of the higher quality and not damaging. There are many materials that will never be right to use with archives, but like junk food, these are often the most attractive because they're cheap and easily available. Materials that fall into the junk food category are polystyrene, poor quality, sticky tapes, plastic bags, new wood. Sometimes it can be tempting to use these materials for temporary storage, but we should avoid even using for that. We may well have to receive items that are already packaged in these sorts of materials, but should never use them ourselves, even in temporary situations, because temporary solutions can so easily become long-term. And if we need to use cheaper materials, it's advisable to stick to a few identifiable types that we have already judged as least likely to cause damage. Things listed here are like records management boxes, polythene sheeting sometimes, especially if this can be used many times over. Um, polyethylene sheeting, sometimes known as jiffy foam. In all areas of life, it can be difficult to completely get rid of using plastics, but reducing and reusing our general use of plastic and making sure that the use of inert polyester for archive packaging is limited to priority collections that need it for for protection and access, such as photographs that are going to be handled. Archive documents often arrive in commercial stationary plastic sleeves, bags and boxes. Make sure these materials are removed when collections go into long-term storage. As you see here on the, um, what's the bottom right-hand side of my slide, I hope it's the same for you, um, the commercial plastic, not only can they uh, cause deterioration and of the paper, increase the, the, the chemical reactions, um, but they can also cause offsetting of ink. We use archival polyester, sometimes known by commercial product names, Melanex and Mylar, because it's inert and doesn't contain plasticizers and won't, um, damage archives in the way that other products will. High quality archive packaging is vital to reduce long-term deterioration of your archive, but they're costly and should be considered in relation to the environment of your storage and the needs of the collection. Like conservation treatments, their use has to be prioritized. For example, if you're going to put if you're able to put vulnerable color or cellulose acetate photographic collections into frozen storage, then there's no need to repackage into photo specification archival packaging because the low temperatures will limit 
the deterioration, both of your object and the packaging. But if you have photographs that are in poor quality, acidic folders are not going into this type of storage, then they would be a priority. So it depends on the circumstances. Here we have the old damaging packaging that we need to have removed in order to retain archives that are sustainable for the long term. Acidic folders, sleeves, treasury tags, soft box files. These are all poor quality and will continue to cause damage to the archives they contain for as long as they hold them. Prioritizing archive packaging and making sure that your material is stored in, in, in a way that will prevent deterioration is part of a sustainable approach because it's more economic, less resource intensive than having to carry out conservation treatments if material becomes damaged, embrittled and deteriorates because um, it remains in poor quality packaging. Other methods of improving sustainability are to take the long established approaches of reduce, reuse, replace and recycle. And this slide outlines some of the ways this can be tackled by reducing plastic, reusing boxes, etc. They're all useful tips, but any activity like this must be part of a wider plan. As early as 2011, Collections care indicators and benchmarks have been developed to encourage organisations take a holistic approach to sustainable development. Each one of these indicators has a series of benchmarks relating to conservation. It would be worth looking at them in relation to how they could fit within an organisational, a wider organisational planning. Um, for example, these are the benchmarks for procurement, which talk about questioning your suppliers on their carbon footprint, sourcing materials locally whenever possible. And although a little old, they are worth looking at and incorporating and changing as appropriate for your circumstances. If sustainability is all about doing things better, maintaining resilience and focusing resources, then preventive conservation is already all about these values. And in common with any preventive action, whether that be risk mitigation or health prevention, it's likely to reduce the amount of effort needed in the future. As the art historian John Ruskin said in 1849, take care of your monuments and you will not need to restore them. Of course, we all want to work efficiently and use resources as effectively as possible. First, we need to have good information on our collections. As part of um, any planning process, gathering and use of evidence is vital to inform that process. Prioritization has to be based on data and to support archive packaging or conservation treatments as needed. In particular, information on material types, what percentage of each media type do you have? What condition and what environment are they stored in? Can you reorganize your storage according to media type and create smaller locations with tighter environmental controls for your most vulnerable material rather than the whole archive? Can you share off-site storage with other organizations? with material that has been digitized or is low use for other reasons. Which material needs to continue to be available physically and therefore is more likely to be considered for conservation? When this information is related to your audience needs and heritage significance, prioritization becomes a much more straightforward exercise. Energy reduction and generally decarbonisation are vital aspects of sustain, sustainability, but are far from the only way in which an archive can change. In April of this year, the National Archives held a conference on this topic, and many of the discussions looked at the way in which archives have to look at all aspects of how they function, 
The website shown here in blue lists many resources on this topic which are worth exploring. There are a large and growing number of resources in this area. For example, Julie's Bicycle, listed here, is a charity working across the arts and culture, which has partnered over 2,000 organisations in the UK and internationally to help them develop environmental expertise, focusing on high impact programmes and policy change, which aim to meet the climate crisis. And another one, Fit for the Future, is an environmental sustainability network which shares knowledge and collaboration to help organisation decarbonise. But in the end, with all the advice and support, it's actions that count. And as I have to, I have to say it again, it's your plan. Everyone needs a plan that will help identify the practical changes that you can make in your circumstances. So just a few more of the resources that are out there that I'm aware of, and I'm sure there are plenty more. Um, the Institute of Conservation has an environmental sustainability network, and there is very recently a book out on low cost tips um, for sustainability in the cultural heritage. And this is an interesting um, case in point. So, this book is um, provided in as low carbon a way as possible. So it's available um, as an ebook and it's print on demand. So um, the theory being that it, there, there isn't wastage. In summary, developing the action plan is of course the most important place to start. And if you've already got one, I hope you will include, have included or will include collections, care and conservation indicators in it. Using evidence on your collections and prioritizing archive packaging and conservation treatments. There are a huge number of online resources and tools out there, do use them and do use the support systems that exist to help all of us work better in this area. And finally, please do share and discuss, discuss your successes so that we can all help each other improve. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Helen, for this informative talk. So now we will continue with Mr. Chris Woods. So Chris Woods uh, is an accredited conservator at National Con uh, Conservation Service with over 30 years of experience in the heritage sector. Previously, his roles included the head of con conservation and collection care at Oxford University and director of collection program services for the Tate Galleries. He has published, lectured, and taught in various fields, such as building and storage environments, archival seals, and plastic photographic negatives. He currently serves as the chairman of the British Standard Institutions Committee, responsible for conservation and care of the archive and library collections. And he and his team currently help people and institutions move from more, uh, conventional preservation methods to more sustainable uh, practices by spending minimal, uh, minimal energy. So Chris, floor is yours. Thank you very much. And mm -hmm. thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I'm delighted to, to talk about uh, an area of building uh, archive sustainability. Um, it's a big topic. I'll only scratch the surface today, but I hope I'll leave you with something really helpful and useful to think about. Um, I'll just share my screen. So, 
Uh, I'll start by looking at the standards that are out there at the moment uh, that promote the idea of sustainable storage. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about the concept of sustainable archive storage. But for the minute, uh, I just want to focus on these standards because they are changing and they are directing us towards um, looking after archives in a more sustainable fashion. Uh, the first most obvious one for archive buildings and museum buildings uh, is 16893 2018. It's a, an EN, a, a European standard, and um, it's published in English and those national uh, languages that national standards organizations choose to translate it to. Uh, and it specifically is promoting passive storage. And then in the UK, but obviously widely available, is the British Standards 4971 2017. That's about the conservation and care of archive and library collections. Um, but it touches, of course, understandably, perhaps, on the environments that we want to provide in storage and on display and use uh, for archival materials. Previous specifications and standards that some of us will be familiar with um, uh, include BS 5454, and that's been around for a long time, since the late 70s. Uh, and its focus at that time was on, um, sorry, was on managing environments using HVAC or ventilation systems. So controlling those climates um, very directly using mechanical and electrical systems. The reason why they were introduced in the, in, at that time, I, I believe, is because it was commonplace in the UK to store an organization's archives in an attic or in a basement. In other words, they were more or less dumped. They weren't providing an archive store. They were storing things in, a suit, in what they thought of as a suitable place. In other words, somewhere where they had a bit of space and nothing else is being used for it. So the objective there was to find a way of ameliorating the poor condition of the environment in those unsuitable spaces. We're not here talking in most cases about purpose-built structures, but the objective was to define what a purpose-built archive at store might be like, recognizing that many were in unsuitable locations. I'll come back to that. The previous specifications tended to uh, focus on remedying problems and doing so by moving air around spaces and controlling the quality of that air. Um, it, when we try to specify to others who are responsible for designing archives and archive stores and so on, um, we need to convey to them what we need. Um, and it's even now the case that the engineering sector, certainly in the UK, is not, has not yet fully understood what we need for archive stores. Of course, it varies across schemes. Um, but when I think of the dozens of schemes that I'm involved in at the moment with new and refurbished buildings, the engineers that are contracted to those projects often really don't understand what we want and they're almost making it up as they go along. So it's for us to really specify. Um, I'll give you an example of this and I'll just come out of this for a minute uh, and go into an example. Um, if we look at, oh, I'll find the right, right one. If we look at the ways in which uh, people um, specify or, or model environments for archives for buildings. This is the classic sort of environmental graph that, that we see. And what we'll see there is a, is a red line, um, uh, which relates to uh, relative humidity inside a space. And the gray line is what's going on outside. So this is a computer generated model the temperature modeling is probably very accurate because it's reflected, uh, it's, it's reflecting external temperature changes over time and how they influence the internal temperature. But the humidity 
model that's generated by this software is completely inaccurate. Uh, a, a reasonably airtight archive store filled very largely with hygroscopic archival material um, is a very different climate to that modeled here. So an engineer designing an archive store will look at what the store should be like, given its location and the structure it might be built to provide. Uh, and it will, and they, and he or she will model something using this software, and that modeling is completely unrealistic um, and completely unhelpful. But it will drive them to, to argue that there is a need for humidity control that's managed by um, uh, by HVAC systems. So in a way, we're driven in that direction, whether we like it or not. So what we have to do then. Uh, is clearly to be able to, to convey better to, to people uh, what it is that we actually want. If I come back to my um, slides. So that's really important, getting people to understand what we actually need means, of course, that we need to understand what we need. Um, Sectorally, then what we've done is we've ceded our authority on how to look after collections to engineering uh, and facilities managers uh, in all, and, and we've sort of accepted in the past that they know best for archive climates, but the reality is not the case. Uh, and we've been rather chasing uh, the wrong direction for decades now in that respect. Um, one of the problems here is is not just whether or not mechanical systems uh, deliver the right sustainably protective environment. Um, and they can, of course, they can deliver things appropriately. But when they fail, uh, they often produce a risk to collections. So, for example, it's very clear to me that over a very long period of time, um, most of the, the serious mold outbreaks in archive collections that I've seen and others have reported to me have been directly as a consequence of the failure of HVAC systems, where they're pushing the, uh, moist air into a room for days on end before people realize. Um, and one of the problems here is that it complete, that, that risk completely undermines what we're trying to do elsewhere. So in a at a stroke, within a couple of weeks, we can do more damage to more materials by a failing uh, ventilation system than a lifetime of individual conservation actions by a conservator in a repository. Um, I haven't got specific figures on this uh, because I've only got the odd project where they've been measuring these things, but where they have done so, it's been quite clear that the energy used by those systems um, uh, represent carbon emissions that can be as much as half or more of those emissions for an archive service. There will be other emissions caused by other parts of what the archive does, but running storage uh, equipment is, is a very energy intensive, carbon hungry, if you like, um, uh, um, operation. So when we look back at those systems that we've been relying on for these decades to, to sustain and preserve our collections, um, we, we ought to look at what are the weaknesses of those systems. Firstly, the fact that fresh air has often been int introduced into the airflow to control that environment. Uh, and when we do that, we're responding to unsuitable external conditions in order to provide suitable internal conditions. So our systems are actually designed to manage fresh air, not the air inside the store. Obviously they do that, but they do it as an extension of their operation. As soon as you shut off fresh air, you don't have that load, as it's called, and you deal with just the air in the space. There's been an obsession for years, which is gradually dissipating now, that archives themselves off-gas ghastly compounds that will themselves destroy, will destroy themselves. Um, uh, that isn't true. They do as they degrade off-gas compounds, but they aren't particularly destructive. There are some. Uh, and one specific acetate plastics um, that are, can be destructive because they produce acetic acid vapors, but they need those materials need anyway to be frozen 
and out of a standard archive store if we want to preserve them. So you take those out of the equation and actually you don't need to constantly change the, 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 the air with fresh air. One of the problems, of course, is that if you're running fans all the time, circulating the air and pulling fresh air in, even when one element such as uh, dehumidification fails, the, air, the fans are still running, so they're pushing unsuitable air in, as I mentioned earlier. Um, there has also been a strict observance on very tight control, so plus or minus one, one degree and maybe plus or minus 5% relative humidity. Most collections are entirely resilient enough to be able to, to slowly change through the seasons from as low as 35% relative humidity up to 60% relative humidity and back. As long as that, that rate of change is slow, they're, it's, they're not significantly at risk uh, through a change of that nature. So we probably need to be able to define what we mean by what I'd call here sustainable conservation storage. What is storage that is sustainable? Um, well, I've put a few points here, uh, but of course you might think of other defining uh, statements. Uh, a most obvious one for me is that you don't need constantly to be attending to how the conditions are. It should be possible to be able to rely on them uh, and that they should change very slowly. That, that seems to be sustainable. Um, another feature I would suggest is that, and it's related to this, that you should be able to, to leave that store of archives alone for a period of time and not be worried constantly that, that the climate might be deteriorating inside it. Um, another is the idea that the building, archive building structure itself um, is what provides a suitable climate, not mechanical systems that rely on energy use and carbon emission to run, to be maintained, to install, of course, and to be replaced over time. Um, another is that you don't need to use energy to maintain those internal conditions. Sustainable storage should involve maintaining internal conditions without the use of energy. Um, and finally, I'd say that you would like a structure that's constructed of materials that will last a long time, uh, and ideally that, that are produced with little or no carbon emissions. So those are things that I would say define sustainable storage, but as I say, you may think of others. Looking again at the building standard, the passive principles, so passive climate control principles, uh, uh, feature these elements. The first is thermal stability, that the temperature changes very slowly uh, and it's not rapidly altered or influenced by external conditions. In other words, it's very heavily insulated in one way or another. Um, I'll come back to that one way or another in a minute, if I may. The other is air tightness. If you get uh, air from outside that isn't uh, suitable, for example, and it's constantly going through your archive store, um, inevitably it will have an impact on the collections within there, particularly if it's carrying moisture. So if you have a very airtight store and then it's filled with dry collections, for example, uh, then those conditions should remain the same over a long period of time. Water tightness seems obvious to me. You need dry buildings, and obviously you want buildings that don't have wet elements in them. They need to be dried out if they're new before you put things in there. And of course, you need to put dry collections in an airtight space so that they're not generating a high humidity themselves. Um, another is that you are monitoring the moisture potential of collections, not just the relative humidity of the air. And um, by that, I usually mean putting data loggers inside archive boxes filled with collections. Those enclosed spaces behave quite differently to just the free air in the room. And I'll return to that too in a second. And then there are low energy or no energy means of keeping uh, stores cool in the, even in the heat of summer. And that's using earth contact. In other words, you don't insulate the ground floor slabs of buildings or you try to provide, even better, you try to provide underground construction so that you have a naturally cool environment to start with. 
things that we probably need to remember then when we're thinking about what archival, sustainable archive storage is about. Um, we need um, a, a watertight space with low air exchange, heavily insulated against external conditions. Um, and to ensure that uh, we get dry conditions, for example, inside packages. Um, an airtight room is, that is also watertight is filled very largely with, uh, with hygroscopic materials, the archives themselves, and they dominate the relative humidity of the air around them. They contain so much more moisture or moisture potential than the tiny amount of moisture that's in the air, but which can be measured by relative humidity. It's very similar to the use of silica gel in an airtight display case. If we want a display, an exhibition to have a stable environment for a long time, we put silica gel in there that's conditioned to the level we want, uh, and we make sure that the case is is, is, dis, is display case is very airtight and that will stabilize the environment inside. That's true of a, of a room as well. Um, and it, it's worth remembering that an RH sensor will rapidly detect changes in the air. Um, and, and many of those will just be an automatic measurement. If the temperature suddenly goes up, the sensor, although no moisture content has changed, will automatically calculate that the relative humidity has gone down, even if in fact the moisture content of the space is exactly the same. So I just come out of this because I want to show you an example of that. Um, these principles that I'm talking about apply inside a box as well as inside a room. Uh, so I'll just show you an excellent example of that. This is one particular archives um, uh, graph of a particular period of monitoring. So if we look on the left in this archive store, we can see the, sen the, the sensor is sitting on a shelf in the free air. We can see the temperature's gone up quite rapidly and it measures that the RH has come down quite rapidly. And then as it cools off quite quickly, um, so the RH is calculated as going up. If we, we then, in this case, took that same data logger, put it inside a box in exactly the same location, a box filled with archives, we get completely the opposite pattern. We can see that as the temperature goes down slightly, uh, the RH goes down as well. Um, and as the temperature goes up, the RH goes up as well. Now, the reason for that is that you have a very enclosed space and the material themselves actually release moisture faster than there can be a change uh, inside that space. It takes a long time for that uh, uh, moisture to dissipate through a box. Um, and you can see that even a substantial temperature change produces a relatively minimal RH change as well. So that the pattern for that is quite different than you might, uh, you would record if you were measuring uh, outside, of a, um, uh, outside of a box. And to give you a nice example of the seasonal pattern, that, for example, our um, thermal modeling type model fails to show. Uh, we can see here, this is a, a particular archive store over the course of four years. And we can see that um, the summertime temperature conditions um, have steadily uh, gone down, as you would expect, as we go into the winter and then up again into the summer, down again, up again, down again across the years. And what the, the relative humidity does is follow that or track that pattern. Um, and so uh, you can see, although it's more minimal, you can see the adjustment going on with temperature and humidity. So in other words, even a, box, a room will do the same as a box because it's dominated by the moisture content of the collections inside it. Um, and that's in a passive climate store. Um, I think it's worth just adding uh, that uh, you can look at passive climate stores and see quite a, a substantially different type of environment. So if we look at, this is a very small room uh, over the course of a year, um, it's entirely passive. We can see that the temperature has gone up significantly um, across the year. It's above ground, it, but it has an uninsulated floor slab and is 
but well insulated walls. It goes up in the summer and back down, and we can see the RH going up and then back down again. Now it stayed up there, and, and that's a, a, an important thing to recall about very small rooms, that they are more influenced by a door, for example. Uh, and it's important to have backup humidification, dehumidification rather, to draw moisture out of the collection to reset it. And this is another example where we have a very stable environment. This is an, an underground store, extremely stable temperature across an entire year there. It's barely moved. Um, it was a relatively recent building, so there's still moisture being emitted by the structure. And we can see there's been a steady gain across the year. The wiggles, by the way, on these graphs are where the log has been taken out and, and, and downloaded. So coming back to our, um, to our slides, I'll just try and move my... screen around properly. So those are the features I felt that we need to, to, uh, to recall. Um, if you have an archive store and you want to reduce your energy and carbon cost, so to speak, and uh, one way of doing this is to try to switch off your systems if they're running air conditioning. So what you'll find is that the internal, in, internal environment of that existing store uh, will be influenced by the air tightness. If it's a very airtight room or reasonably airtight room, uh, the archives will dominate the relative humidity. Obviously, it will depend on whether there's water getting in the room. If there is, you need to remedy that uh, as a primary task. Clearly, it will be affected. There's a lot of heat gain through walls, for example, winter heating. Uh, you need to make sure that it's well insulated. Um, the moisture content of the collection is important um, because if you were to put, if you've got um, collections that are sitting in 70% RH for a long time, they will absorb a great deal of water, they will have absorbed a great deal of water and, and they will create that uh, humidity when you switch your systems off. So it's important to know what level they're at when you switch off. And it will be important to know what time of the year it is because you'll get that natural temperature cycle as well influencing things. And I just want to show you a good example. Uh, this is a very large store where they had um, air conditioning systems operating, failing during the summer, partly because they had fresh air, partly because of the nature of the systems. Um, when we switched off, we dehumidified for a period because they were at a dangerous level of humidity. Um, and, oops, sorry, go back one. Um, and then once we'd got to a safe level, we switched off. This is a building built in the 1990s, uh, and it turned out to be very airtight relative to the quantity of material in it, and it stayed very stable. That blue line is the temperature. Um, and uh, you'll be able to see from this that the temperature stayed, after it switched off, the temperature stayed within uh, six or so, five to six degrees across the year. Um, and it, the RH was extremely stable. That was inside a box. So, if you want to test whether your, your uh, stores are suitable for passive climates, um, what you're looking for is a slow rate of change. Ideally, I would say less than half a degree in 24 hours. Uh, in fact, that's not very onerous for a reasonably well-constructed store. I'd be looking for even lower than that if you can, but that would be good. Um, what we want to see is relative humidity changing only when the temperature changes, so that tracking up and back down again. You know then that you've got an airtight store. Um, and uh, what you want to see is that the RH inside a box um, is changing very slowly and is behind the RH measurements in a room so that you've got time to decide whether you need to download loggers inside a, a box, for example, uh, and when you might want to bring in dehumidification, which if it's a good airtight room might be only every few years, every five years or more, depending on the nature of the structure of your building. Um, so things you can do then, uh, fix water leaks and damp penetration for sure. Look at membrane paints on walls. Uh, Helen will be able to tell you a bit about this. Um, uh, Duxford have got a very good example, a new paper store uh, with a membrane paint that provides an extremely airtight environment inside. Uh, and it's a very cheap, relatively cheap way of 
uh, improving massively improving the airtightness of an existing structure as well. Uh, make sure to support that, that you have well sealing doors. So you replace doors that aren't well sealed with those that are, or, or make sure there are sealing strips. And if you've got uh, gas suppression, for example, for fire, uh, fire protection, make sure that they've got motorized caps on them because otherwise they're just essentially uh, holes in the walls. And you can test that by simply putting cling film over them to see whether air is being drawn into the room. Um, in order to maintain good conditions, you should, after you've done your test and characterized your space, you should find that all you need is a small desiccant dehumidifier, uh, which you can replace your old uh, HVAC system with using recycled air only, albeit with a mechanism to add fresh air if you really need it for some reason, like smoke extract. Um, Instead of relying on cooling systems to, to, to dehumidify, I could tell you a, there's a whole talk on cooling systems and dehumidification and why they don't work properly. Um, only switch on dehumidification when you've got a consistent period of high RH and preferably you'll work out uh, that it needs, it, uh, needs to be done in the winter following a high RH summer, but you could also bring it on in the summer as well. Um, and you need a certain, amount of moisture out of the collections then to reset or recondition those collections. It's usually around two and a half to three percent of the weight of the collections in water. So for big collections it's a lot and it might take you a few months to draw that water out, um, but that would be the calculation you'd make about the size of the dehumidifier uh, based on the weight of the collection. Um, look at reducing airflow size for any backup. You don't really, you don't need it to be done incredibly quickly. Quickly, You don't need massive duct sizes as been traditional with HVAC systems. Um, it's fine to do it uh, um, slowly as long as you're doing it steadily. Um, and use microclimate packages for very sensitive objects. Don't condition an entire room just for the sake of one small group of material like audiovisual material that might, uh, might magnetic audiovisual material, for example, that might need uh, more, uh, more tight RH conditions. So finally, um, why do we think passive climate storage is worth doing? Well, clearly, as I think Helen has touched on, our objective is to conserve collections for future generations. Um, and it's a bit pointless if we're contributing to environmental disaster. Uh, and because ultimately, if we don't address the issues of carbon emissions and ex excessive energy use and so on, there won't be people to look at our collections in the future. So it really is important to be consistent. Um, it's quite clear that constant mechanical systems have not been suitable. They have not worked to protect our collections. Had they worked, we might have a different argument to make, but they haven't. They've risked and damaged our collections. Um, so that also is, is inconsistent with our objective to look after collections for future generations. And finally, in most archive and library settings, sustainable storage is easy and cheap to, to achieve and it saves money. So why would you not do it? That's the end of my talk, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chris, for this very informative, uh, for this very informative talk. Uh, so I have a question. Actually, we have questions uh, on the chat section, maybe you said, but uh, I will start with mine <laughs> as the moderator. So, uh, I mean, Helen, during her presentation, talked about the sustainable action plan, but I think, you know, we can ask this question to both of you. Uh, it's a general one, but it's an important one, I believe. So it's obvious that there are things that can be done in a short time and things that can be done in a long time period, right? So what should be the priorities in the sustainable action plan and what would be the most immediate action that we should take? Well, well, building passive climate building storage is like one of the things, <laughs> as far as I can see. But what 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 would be your response to this question? Shall I uh, uh, shall I go first? Well, um, I think if galvanizing your staff to be on board with ideas and 
um, systems that get put in place is one really, really important aspect of any plan because it's there is the relationship between the small things that you can do and then the bigger tasks. And um, I think uh, the, the, the bigger tasks are vital, but then so are the smaller areas. And that will rely on the sort of the, the, the sort of, um, you know, the, the desire, if you like, of individuals to work in this area. So I would say, get ideas from your staff, get, um, look at your particular circumstances you know every organizations are so different so what you know what I think you can organize the area you can the the subjects the topics in terms of you know your consumables your relationship with your suppliers your energy use so those are standard mm -hmm. areas it's it's how you then make a difference and make change that really you have to engage with I think one of the things that can happen is that consultants are brought in from outside to create a plan and that can be okay but I think actually if the plan can be emerged out of your organization it will be much more likely to work and much more likely to um to, to be effective, if you like. So I'm not going to give you a, a sort of a thing to do because there are so many things that can be done and um, it really depends on your circumstance. And in a way, it's like in your personal life, you, we sort of, we all know the things that will make us healthier and better people and recycle. And, you know, it depends on what we feel, you know, able to tackle a lot of the time so mm. yeah. thank you i'm sure you chris has got some more well? yeah wise uh, well, words. I suppose, if i focus on building since that's what i'm talking about today um if you've got an existing archive um and it's been using air conditioning systems or hvac systems uh, i would prepare yourself uh to carry out a period of testing when you switch off those systems, uh, monitor the conditions inside boxes as well as outside boxes of archives. And in the case of volumes stacked on shelves or standing on shelves, place loggers, data loggers behind books because they provide an enclosed environment as well um, in the same way that a box does. And uh, monitor rigorously for a period of time. If you know at the point at which you've switched off your air conditioning system um, that the humidity has been very high, my advice is to switch off but introduce dehumidifiers and draw moisture out of the collection. Otherwise, there will be a risk in this testing period. So that period of testing is really important. Look for weaknesses in the structure as well while you're doing that testing, identify the air tightness and so on. There are lots of other features that, that I could spend time looking at, but we haven't got that much time. So plan to do a full 12 months seasonal cycle of monitoring, detailed monitoring. And at the end of that, you can identify um, during and at the end of that, you can identify what changes you might need to make for, to your store. Um, in order to make sure that you don't need to run those systems and that what systems you introduce to replace big old ones are smaller and more targeted. Um, something that uh, I noticed in the chat there was mention of, uh, and I know Helen has touched on, um, magnetic media on polyester tape, that is VHS and audio cassettes, um, they can be microclimate packaged so that they've got a dry RH environment. Temperature is much less significant for them. Acetate magnetic material is acetate. So ultimately you probably will need to freeze it. In both those cases, they need to be copied as soon as possible. So if you're thinking about long-term sustainable storage, where you have a, a seasonally adjusting environment, albeit very slowly changing, 
uh, then think about your collections as well and whether there are some sensitive ones that need slightly different uh, conditions and look at those low energy means of doing that, like microclimate packaging. So those would be a, uh, the things that I would recommend in the short term. Thank you for your responses. So, uh, I mean, we have questions both in Turkish and in, and in English. So for practical reasons, I will start with the questions asked in English, if that's okay for everybody. So the first question is coming from Sina Matar. So he, he asks, dear Chris, in case of the disaster plans, like unwanted economical issue, issues or supplier problems, how much archival storage materials should be bought in advance? I think if I've understood you, this would be about emergency response materials and equipment. So I would certainly recommend from an environmental point of view, having a good size uh, dehumidifier available to you because very often emergency responses involve water and needing to dry uh, a place out. So having equipment like that would be extremely useful. Um, and then after that, I'd, I'd agree that you need to have a certain amount of material um, and it will, you'll need to define that based on your plan. So if your plan says, as so often is the case in the UK, I don't know whether that's the case elsewhere, I'm sure it is in America too. If your plan says, we can manage to deal with one shelf worth of wet material or damaged materials, but anything bigger than that, like a whole collection or a whole rack of moldy material, we will get a contractor in to take those out and, and, and deal with them. If that is your plan, uh, then actually you could probably keep otherwise unused materials to a minimum and focused on the amount that you can deal with. There is no point in planning how to deal with a whole collection of wet materials when you've already decided that you will get a contractor to do that. If on the other hand, you think you're going to do that yourself and you have the facilities to do it, then obviously you would have to plan to have a great deal. Um, so it will depend on your situation and circumstance. I, I think probably Helen's got a view as well on that. Um, yes, I, I think with disaster plans and um, uh, you, you can actually reduce down the amount of um, supplies to quite a low, low level. Um, and particularly if you sort of do a risk assessment of what are the most likely um, things to happen if you you know are, are liable for leaks um, which we are in the, in the in the UK particularly with more sort of sudden rainfall we're getting a lot more leaking in buildings that we didn't have in the past um, and um, you can you can reuse materials that soak up material you can um, concentrate on having equipment that is reusable um, and um, you know work with other organizations I, 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 I think the idea of having lots of huge stores is is probably unnecessary particularly now with you know we can buy things really quickly a lot of the time so if you need you know hard hats and torches you can get um, and actually, most of the time, if you have an incident, a large incident in a building, you won't be able to get into that building anyway. So you've got time to purchase what you need. I think there's an awful lot of equipment that ends up in stores going out of date and then has to be disposed of. And I, I think I think it's absolutely an area that, you know, is is where there is quite a lot of wastage. So worth thinking about. Yeah. Okay, so our next question is about the temperature. So what should be done to measure the temperature and our, our age as shown in your graphs in a passive climate storage environment and how often? Okay, um, if it's a test to find out how your building performs without ventilation systems running, then I would get your equipment, I'll come back to that in a minute, you get your equipment and, and monitor 
diligently. So I would be looking every few days for the first two to three weeks to see how things perform. If, as is quite likely in many cases, uh, conditions are very slowly changing, then you can leave uh, the period for longer. And the more you understand about your building structure and the risks and that initial data, the, the, that, that those bits of information will help you understand how frequently you need to be monitoring. We tend to use small, uh, cheap um, uh, digital data loggers. We have in the past been using ones that needed recycling. We're trying to move towards ones where we can replace batteries, for example, while keeping the cost down. Uh, we, on the other hand, we provide environmental monitoring for something like 80 institutions. So, you know, we've been looking at different models of, of dealing with that. But, but there are so many now on the market. Um, you really want one that you're confident the battery will last for a good amount of time and not be expiring after a few weeks. Um, so there are models like log tag, which we use a lot of, uh, Gemini tiny tags, where you can replace batteries, hobos, very good units. The price is going up there in that, in that little list. Uh, that's why we tend to use log tags a lot because we're buying so many. But if you're investing in a few, then, then you would be, it's worthwhile looking at the uh, better ones. We don't need incredible sophistication and precision on RH in particular. What we want to see is the general trends. And it, you only really need precision when you're at the top end of the RH peak at sort of the low, low 60% RH. And then you probably want to be absolutely clear whether you're peaking above 65% or below 65%. But most of the time, you're just looking for trends to understand how your building performs. Uh, and if you, if you recognize that the relative humidity environment in which an archive and library store uh, is safe is very wide, and you have a reasonably stable structure that only changes by the temperature moving the moisture content of the collections. You may find the variation in your room is no more than 15% across the entire seasonal period. So understanding that pattern is probably most important. And then I would just emphasize again, you really need to get little data loggers inside boxes because and behind books, because that's the only way you'll get a realistic understanding of the moisture content potential in your collection. Okay, thank you again. And then, you know, there is this issue of collaboration between the institutions, right? So maybe we can talk about it a little bit. Actually, there is one question related to, to that specific issue. So the question is, what kind of collaborations do you recommend to the institutions which lack budget in terms of investing costly storage and preservation expenses? or do each institution should act on its own according to its own needs? Well, um, I mean, I think the most obvious places for collaboration are around purchasing materials um, and um, collaboration of storage locations. Both of those things are not easy um, to really properly come into sync with needs um and um but i think the benefits are really significant if you can create a system where your 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 needs are similar um and you you sort of work together and and i think there's there's um there's an awful lot of soft benefits and hard benefits that so you can have financial um um, advantages by sharing space, sharing materials, but then there's all sorts of other benefits that will arise from that sort of collaboration around, you know, all sorts of areas um, that that happen. So I think they're worthwhile. Um, I mean, they usually are have to be local, so it really does depend on, you know, who have you got nearby, <laughs> and uh, you know, and and you know across you know can you work across um art, you know archives to library to museum is that feasible um or is it better to keep within an archive arena if you like um though again those are questions that 
you know, there aren't standard answers to that it depends on your circumstances. But, you know, I think collaborations, they grow, um, you know, once you start them, they can mushroom in a way that is really beneficial. If I can just focus on storage for a minute, I think Helen won't be surprised if I mention the storage scheme that we operate with a big commercial provider. Um, one of the founding principles of that has been that um, people are pooling collections in very large stores and therefore the energy and other costs associated with it per cubic meter of collections stored there is much lower. Um, and so collaborative storage, however it's done, whether it's in the commercial sector or otherwise, is definitely worthwhile. I'd also like to say, I think really importantly uh, for me, um, there has been a tendency for us to think, it's partly because in the UK our sector is, is a series of silos, rather, uh, libraries, archives, museums, galleries, um, or has been, it's less so now than it was. Um, the enormous hygroscopic, I would say the word ballast, mass that archive and library collections represent and provide in a store is what stabilizes a passive climate storage. Um, and so it's beneficial for people who have collections of paintings or large wooden objects like furniture um, and other material that that don't have a lot of hygroscopic mass, but are hygroscopically sensitive. So they are sensitive to moisture changes and they will want to see stable environments, but a passive climate store is much harder to deliver stability for if you don't have that hygroscopic mass. So collaborating with museum archive and library storage is really worthwhile. And if you're an organization that has a mix don't separate out your different collections. Use the ballast of your archive collections to stabilize the storage environment for everything else that you own. Yeah. I mean, I, absolutely. I, I was going to say earlier when you were talking, Chris, that the archives have a massive advantage in the fact that you have all this huge bulk of, of, of paper-based material and that can... Uh, absolutely can be really beneficial to mix with other media. Um, I think there are, within that, there are some collection types that are so vulnerable that you might, you you do need to think about their particular needs, um, you know, sort of in terms of bringing the temperature down, which you wouldn't want to for the whole, a whole lot, if you like, so which I'm sure, you know, you would agree with. So, but absolutely mixed, mixed collections um yeah um, and and paper can you know paper even within its um uh, different types so if you have brittle paper um obviously that's more vulnerable but um so uh but you know i would propose that the packaging is incredibly important brittle paper so you know and that's where maybe where you would prioritize a, you know a higher quality of packaging rather than environment for particular material type so mm -hmm. it's all about knowing your collections and mm -hmm. um knowing the condition and the variability within them i think mm -hmm. yeah Okay, thank you again. Uh, so we need to wrap the things up. <laughs> I think we are running out of time. But there is one more question that I would like to ask before we finish our session. So uh, the, our participants asked mm -hmm. about the again the temperature. So in the previous standards, she says the ideal temperature often was suggested and therefore controlled environments were seen as the best solutions. Now the inverse is suggested. So from the pr pr presentation, we understand the advantages of having a passive climate storage, right? So, so the question is, is there a particular disadvantage that we should consider? Uh, disadvantage in respect of um, 
controlled environments or disadvantage in respect of passive environments? Uh, I think the passive environments. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I would say, I think if I've understood it correctly, I would say if you are in a position and you've understood your collections, as Helen was rightly pointing out, um, to create a store with a view to it being very sustainable, there are certain features that mean there are no disadvantages. Uh, and, though, and that's, in other words, an ideal scenario of which there are some around, they're good examples. Um, an ideal scenario for collections of an archival nature is that your temperature changes very slowly and remains cool all year round without needing to actively cool. And there's one place you can definitely do that, and that's below ground, because below ground, uh, at a certain meterage below ground, the temperature is consistently between eight and 10 degrees all year round, anywhere in the world. Um, and you can do that in hillsides. You don't have to do it on flat plains. It doesn't have to be in a flood plain, for example. So you can achieve very stable conditions, much more stable than air conditioning systems ever could. Although we specified in the past plus or minus one degree, for example, very few air conditions ever achieved that all year round every year for decades on end. They didn't. They, they were constantly failing. So in that respect, um, there is no disadvantage if you can get that location right. And the same would apply for archive storage around humidity. Again, if you have a, a thermally very stable and very airtight and watertight structure, the RH will change very, very minimally across the entire annual cycle. And you'll see an RH change of less than 5% across an entire year. Now, old systems like BS5454 we're recommending were plus or minus 5% RH. So in other words, a, a range of 10%. Again, had they been able to man manage that consistently year in, year out, affordably without failure, we'd say fine, they're good, you know, apart from the energy costs. But the fact is they never did. They were constantly failing. So once again, there is no disadvantage to a properly airtight, very dry structure and one that's very thermally stable, if that makes sense to you. So you get an even more stable environment than you would otherwise. So while we are saying they're capable of surviving in more varied seasonal changes, the fact is you can create a very, very stable uh, passive climate store. Uh, if you if you have the opportunity to do so, yeah, I'd I'd like to absolutely. Um, we we agree. We we have a, a passive house paper store at the museum, and I think they are slightly more expensive to build. There is no doubt about it. But you will save that money in your running costs, and you know create the additional benefit. Um, and um, I think they are really impressive buildings. They're, they're pleasant to be in. They have a, an atmosphere to them that is, you know, really, really sort of makes everybody feel good. Um, you know, so, uh, and, and that's that's important because air conditioning can be quite unpleasant to, to, to sort of work with and work around. So I think that's something to bear in mind. But um, I think, because there, there is a lot of emphasis on the build, you often get much better quality buildings as well. So they do cost a little bit more, but you will get a better quality building and it will, and it, and it will function better over the long term. I, I wouldn't disagree with, with Helen lightly here. I would only say actually they can be less expensive uh, because you don't have the massive capital cost of mechanical systems. Yeah, you strip that, out what true. is very often hundreds and hundreds of thousands yeah. of pounds of design and construction cost and installation. And actually you end up with a structure that where your budget is cheaper. And, and a good example would be the passive store at, at Duxford because it yeah. was cheaper than previous estimates would have been. No, you're right. So, you're, you're right. You're, you're quite correct, Chris. I was just thinking of the actual building. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, as I was <laughs> announcing that we are about to finish our session, we 
proceed one more question, which I find quite important. So with your permission, I'm going to go ahead and ask this question as well before, our, before we uh, conclude our session. So it's about digital preservation, actually. So is digital preservation bad for the environment or, you know, uh, to put it another way, how can digital preservation be environment friendly if it's not already, if it's not so already? Um, I don't have data on, 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 the, co on the costs of um, keeping, maintaining digital data over the long term compared to maintaining a book on a shelf, for instance. I, um, I think it's changed over the years. I think when we were first digitizing, they, they reckoned that it was an awful lot more expensive to maintain the digital data. Um, I, I suspect that um, there are a lot of difficulties in that maintenance of servers and um, but I have to say I'm not I don't know the specifics um, I don't know Chris whether you have done those or are aware of those comparisons no I think I would just have a particular angle on this that um, I remember when we first started talking about passive climate stores avoiding the energy costs some architects in particular would come back with the notion that actually, as long as we've got renewable energy sources, uh, why would we care about the energy costs of running air conditioning systems? Now, actually, that argument has dimmed in recent times because of, partly, of course, because the energy costs have gone sky high, um, but also because of the carbon emissions inherent in constructing and running mechanical kit. It's not just the energy costs and the carbon from that. So while you might be able to put a renewable system in and show some form of efficiency over time, the fact remains there is actually an ex excessive cost. Um, you could though uh, make the case that as long as digital storage provision is uh, low energy and renewable energy, if, if it can be, then, then it has a relatively good efficient impact because you get a massive amount of storage for a relatively low amount of energy use or carbon emission use. Um, so that's a big if, I would say. Um, uh, obviously, paper-based and other heritage analog material, if we build our stores or refurbish our stores appropriately, by definition, by my definition of sustainable storage, we'll just carry on surviving indefinitely uh, without the need for energy use in order to achieve that. Um, so on balance, my feeling is that uh, it would require constant renewable and a big shift in the energy provision sector for, sorry, the digital provision sector for it to be um, as efficient as a really good uh, archival store of paper analog materials. Okay, thank you. So one of our participants actually contributed to the session with a comment. So I'm just going to go ahead and read that brief comment. Uh, he says, uh, Mehmet Janatar, Mehmet Bey, he says that I will have a small assessment. I would like to thank both speakers, translators, and organizers. Quite empathetic statements were made about the sustainability of the archives, in particular, the eligibility requirements of the archive building and the emphasis on the results of placing too much emphasis on mechanical systems were quite important. And I think the archivists and the officials of our country will benefit from this program. And he concluded the comment by thanking you. Yeah, okay. So, uh, and uh, thank you again for joining us today. And the, 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 this session I think was quite productive and instructive. Uh, we, we learned a lot about the sustainable practices uh, when it comes to preserving the archive, uh, when it comes to uh, preserving the archival material. So again, thank you very much for being with us. I, I also would like to thank you to, the, to our participants who contributed to the session with their comments and questions. So 
Uh, and also, you know, before we conclude our session, I would like to make one more announcement. We have another session to be held during this evening, and our speakers will be Joshkun Aral and Nebil Özgenturk. Özgenturk. So if you are available, if our participants available, please come and join us again at 6 p.m. So again, thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. -bye. Bye.